You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. I want to thank you for joining us this evening. We're very excited to offer this exciting wine show here on West Hartford Public Television. And what you'll be in store for, for the next, hopefully, many shows, is a great selection and sampling of inexpensive wines that taste like expensive wines. And there's a big misconception out there that wines have to be expensive or fancy or you have to buy them for the most prestigious wine stores. But that's not really true. What me, and my host, James Kimbrough, will be talking about, is the ability to pick out wines at any local packet store or wine store that are both good, tasty, and relatively inexpensive. And in future shows, you'll be able to do blind tastings with us and your friends to show them that not always do the most expensive wines taste the greatest. Now, before we get into our first tasting, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what the show will be about in coming episodes. Today's show will just be an introduction as to maybe some of the types of wine. We're going to be doing Spanish wines tonight, just two. We don't want to get everybody drunk. And future episodes will entail probably four to five wines from different varieties, whether it be French, Spanish, maybe um, Argentinian, Argentinian South maybe Africa. Italian. So many great great regions out there. And we'll be sneaking in a somewhat expensive bottle with three to four inexpensive bottles and having friends and strangers taste them to see what they think tastes the best. Today's episode though is just really going to be the basics. We're going to start off tasting two Spanish wines, but before we even get that far, I just want to go over a brief concept of what you should have when you're going to drink wine. Now obviously, James, you need glasses. Very important. Why are glasses important? Well, the, the stemware actually uh, shapes the wine. Uh, you're going to have different styles of glasses uh, for different types of wine. Now, tonight we've got the same glass here, uh, but if you're drinking a big, bold Cabernet Sauvignon, you're going to have a different glass than you would if you're going to be drinking a Chardonnay or a Sauvignon Blanc. In general, uh, do you, would you use a wider glass for a red than what we have here tonight? Yes, yeah, so you want a big bowl. Uh, a lot of swirling action in the glass, and then when you're going to smell the wine, uh, the wine, the shape of the glass will dictate where the wine hits your tongue as well as uh, how it gets into the nose. So it's very important to choose the appropriate stemware for the right kind of wine. Do you think there's any benefit of some people like the tumblers, for instance? Do you prefer a tumbler or do you prefer a stem glass? I like a stem glass. With a tumbler, uh, there is no stem, and you have to, you're forced to hold the glass in your hand Mm -hmm. uh, your hand will actually warm the wine, and we're going to talk a lot about temperature, correct storage temperature for wines later on, but uh, warming the wine is, is usually not a good idea. Uh, Especially for you... red, usually. Yes. We also have, which I'm sure some of you have already noticed, a carafe. And I think no matter what type of wine you're drinking, whether it's an inexpensive wine or an expensive wine, mm -hmm. wine benefits from breathing and opening up in something like a Exactly. Red. Uh, uh, with reds especially. Uh, when you pour a wine into a, a decanter like this, you're getting a lot of oxygen into the wine, and that helps the wine breathe and open up, especially with the older wines. Uh, you know, they've been 
they've been laying down for quite a few years. They need to they need time to to open up before you're ready to enjoy them. Now, in your experience, do you think there's any time frame as to when you should open up a bottle? You're having friends over, say you're going to have a dinner party. Do you want to have the wine open before they get there, or do you want to open it up when they get there? Uh, the rule of thumb is about an hour before you're going to drink it. So if, if your friends are going to arrive and you're going to drink it immediately when they get there, you want to pop it and, and decant it about an hour before they, they arrive. Uh, if you're going to have, uh, like we do, a little champagne first and then some wine Which later. Which is important. Always do the champagne <laughs> first. Um, you know, once everyone arrives, start drinking the champagne and then uh, plan about an hour ahead of time and pop your red, decant it. Now, there are some people who say that you could also use a craft for a white wine. I don't follow that. Uh, not really necessary, no. Uh, no, that's, this is uh, primarily for reds. So any varietal white really does not need to be opened up necessarily. I wouldn't do it, no. So while you're taking that in, we're going to open up our first bottle of wine tonight, a Merlot Tempranillo. I think it's a 55% to 45% yep. blend. Jim will be the expert in terminology. <laughs> I will be sort of just critiquing the taste of it more than the critique of the actual pronunciation. So, Jim, I know that's a twist-off bottle, and do you have any thoughts as to the misconceptions of twist-off Well, bottles? the twist-off used to indicate that this is a very bad wine or a poor quality wine. Uh, today, a lot of vineyards are switching to twist-offs for several reasons. Twist-off doesn't leak. Uh, sometimes a cork will leak. Um, that's the reason why when you store a wine, you want to lay it on its side if it has a cork in it. Uh, that keeps the cork wet. Uh, keeps it from leaking. But from time to time, you'll open a bottle that has a cork in it, you'll get a musty smell. That indicates that the cork has let oxygen into the bottle, the wine's gone bad. Uh, it either turns to vinegar or it gets a very musty uh, odor to it. Uh, it's not suitable for drinking or for cooking at that point. Uh, so some vineyards have switched to the twist off uh, in order to avoid that problem. Other vineyards have switched to what's called a Stelvin cap, which is a fake cork, and you'll see this in a lot of uh, wines um, that are currently sold. You'll pull out a plastic cork, uh, and again, that's not a sign of an inferior wine. Uh, that's an indication that the vineyard has switched to a newer technology in order to avoid uh, some of the spoilage that you'd get. Uh, I think the statistic is 4 to 6 percent of bottles that have a cork in them go bad. Um, and when you switch to this, the twist-off cap or the Stelvin cap, you avoid the spoilage, uh, therefore the vineyard is able to market all of their wine. Well, that's actually a question that I don't think anybody knows the answer to yet, is what is the lifespan of a twist-off? Has it been around long enough where we can get an adequate determination as to how long it will last? My personal opinion is uh, those are for wines that are not going to be stored too terribly long. Uh, you get some wine collectors who are going to put a bottle down and they'll store it for 10, 20 years before drinking it. With a twist off, uh, usually that's something you're going to drink within a few years. Would you still recommend storing it this way? Uh, it, it, it really, it really doesn't, doesn't matter. Doesn't make a difference. It really doesn't matter, no. Well, I'm going to open this up. No secret to opening up a twist top. I know there's a lot of elegance that goes into opening a bottle of wine or a bottle of champagne, but not to this type of bottle. You just give it a twist. Now, what me and uh, James like doing a lot is having dinner parties with a lot of people over. And one thing we have noticed that when we are doing a dinner party, whether it's with wine or champagne, it's best, if you're going to do especially a blind tasting, not to get people's misconceptions up about what you're drinking. Just tell them you're going to be drinking a, a general variety of different types of red without getting in their mind that, oh, I'm drinking, say, a $500 bottle of Bordeaux. Say you're drinking Spanish wine tonight. Say you're drinking um, Italian wine tonight. But don't go into any specifics. Just have the bottles out there for them to see, but covered. See, you see the bottle, <laughs> but it's covered. Yeah, I enjoy getting their first impression uh, and not having any kind of preconceived notions on their part. So if they, if they don't know the price point, they don't know the region, uh, you get a better idea of just uh, their initial reaction to the wine. I will pour this. Now, obviously, this hasn't breathed as long as it generally would if you were in your own home, but you get the general idea. And when you're tasting wine, you want to give it a little swirl, get some oxygen into it, get the aroma coming out of the glass. Sometimes you'll get a lot of fruit. Uh, sometimes you'll get a, a bit of an acidic uh, aroma or a floral aroma if you're drinking uh, whites. 
It could be the studio. It could be a little cool, but <laughs> I'm not sensing much bouquet on this one. It does have some legs. You see the wine clinging to the glass, and it drips down in several different spots. So those are the legs. And I actually find that the longer the legs, the longer the flavor on the tongue. Yes, and it's also an indication of body. Uh, a wine with a lot more body is going to have longer legs. Uh, and again, that's not necessarily a reference to the taste, uh, but it's, it's more of the feel in the mouth. The legs seem to be average. I get a little tobacco at the end of this and some leather. Now you'll, you'll hear wine connoisseurs throw out all kinds of descriptive words when they're describing the taste of a wine. Uh, and some of it seems like items that you would never eat. You'll hear grassy, you'll hear gunpowder. I just mentioned leather and tobacco, which is in this wine. Um, and there, there really are no right or wrong answers when you're trying to describe a wine. You just want to describe terms that you're familiar with. So if, if you taste something, and it might be something you've smelled in the past and not necessarily put in your mouth, Go ahead and throw that word out. And that's one of the things, or one of the reasons I wanted to do this show, because Greater Hartford area is full of wine stores, restaurants, where people sort of really, well, to put it bluntly, sort of consider themselves wine snobs. <laughs> and I want to really take that misconception down a notch, especially with some of the Spanish uh, wines, because a lot of the Spanish wines are very reasonably priced, and I think compete with some of the best ones mm -hmm. out there. And I think one of the reasons Spanish wines are so good and so flavorful is, well, they've been growing wine and uh, grapes for thousands of years. They've been doing it for quite a while. Just like the yeah. Italians have. And, you know, there's still that misconception that French wines still are the cream of the well, crop. Well, that's, that's, yes, that's, and that's what France wants everyone to believe, is that they make the best wines in the world. Uh, I personally think that you can find a great wine in any region, and it's really your own personal palate. Uh, everyone's palate is different. You know, a wine that I think is great, Bob might not like, something that he's really hyping, I might not enjoy. Uh, and then you at home might taste whatever we're having tonight and, and think they're both horrible. But uh, there is a wine out there for you. And so people who have tried wines in the past and don't think that they are wine lovers just haven't found the right wine, in my opinion. And that, that's also important because when you go into a wine store or a packet store, wherever you buy your wine, try to stay away from the big box names wine or wines that just you've seen on television or you just know that you know, from your childhood that that's what your parents drank and it just seems familiar. Try to walk into different sections where, you know, say they have French, Spanish, Italian, Argentinian wines, and look for obscure labels. Look for something in the price point, say, between $6.99 to $12.99. And don't be afraid to try it, because a lot of times that's any wine that's under $20. Some people think, well, I'm not going to serve that to my guests because they're going to think I'm cheap. No, that's what we're going to try to get you to stop thinking that way, because there are hundreds Probably, well, there actually probably are hundreds. Yeah, there are. Unfortunately, we haven't tasted hundreds, <laughs> but I'm sure there are that taste just as good as wines in the $20, $30, $40, and $50 range, yeah. if not higher. And you touched on my big rule of thumb, which is try it before you buy it. Uh, I go to wine tastings uh, pretty much every Saturday. Uh, you can find your local uh, wine distributor, and they're usually going to have a wine tasting between 1 and 5 o'clock. Go in, try a couple of wines. Uh, they usually have four or five lined up. It's a great way for you to get exposed to different varietals. Um, you know, if you, if you only drink Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, and you go into this tasting, you're, you'll find that they're having a Champagne tasting, they're having a Chardonnay tasting, maybe a, a Merlot, and then they'll throw in a Red Zinfandel and, and possibly a Cab. So you get to taste everything uh, without having to pay it, uh, put down big money for a bottle that, that you may or may not like. Once you find something you like, buy a lot of it and, serve it, and don't be afraid to serve it to your friends. That is true. If you do find something you like, especially at any of the local tastings that are in town or around the greater Hartford area, if you do like something, you should buy it, at least a half a case, because you might not be able to find it again. And one of the things that I found out is I've gone to tastings and I've tried a wine, I bought one bottle. Well, that doesn't last long. No. And then you want to have friends over to experience how much you enjoyed that wine, and lo and behold, you can't find it. So a plug to any of our local affiliates out there who sell wine, if you do wine tastings, make sure you sell enough of it so people can buy enough of it and keep you in business and keep people like us happy. So, <laughs> The other of, rule of thumb I wanted to, to, just before we get to the rest sure. of this, uh, my second rule of thumb is uh, drink wines that you enjoy. If, uh, and this goes back to uh, the whole food-wine pairing conundrum. Uh, it used to be a rule of thumb that if you were drinking 
uh, red wine, you had to have red meat with it. Um, if you're having a big, juicy steak, you wanted to have a, a cab with that. Um, let's say that you enjoy Chardonnays, though. Don't be afraid to go out and find a Chardonnay that will match up with that steak. Um, it's it's the, the, whole, the old notion of uh, whites with fish and poultry and reds with red meat has gone by the wayside. And, and now, today, people are saying, hey, just drink what you enjoy. That's right. Do you think that reds pair well with spicy food occasionally? Occasionally, yes. And it, but again, it's, it's what your palate uh, demands. And if, if you have a palate that looks for uh, Chianti's or Sangiovese's, um, and you're going to try and pair that with a spicy food, it's, it's going to be difficult, but there are some wines out there that, that can do that for you. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. And before we take the next sip of that one, which I think was what again? This is the uh, Grenache Syrah blend. It's 85% uh, Grenache, it's, so it's primarily Grenache, but it has a little bit of Syrah blended in with it. Again, this is another Spanish wine. Um, and even though it's a blend, I mean, you can get either 100% Syrah or you can get 100% Grenache. Um, a blend is a good way to sort of, what, experience a combination of the flavors? Yeah, typically uh, if you're drinking one varietal, uh, it has some harsh notes to it. And so uh, vineyards will do some blending to kind of even that out. And uh, a Merlot is a great example. Oftentimes a Merlot will be used to even out a, a very strong Cab or Red Zinfandel. But in this case, they've used a Syrah. So let's give this one let's a taste. Let's give this one a taste. Now, I could already see the legs on this one are a little bit thicker. It looks like it's definitely hanging up there a little yep. bit longer than the other one. Let's see if it does the same thing on my tongue. Okay. Now, it's a noticeably different taste as compared to the first one. I taste a lot more fruit in this one. Yep. And uh, whereas this one had the harsh kind of tobacco leather finish, this one's a much easier, smoother, round, as I like to call it, finish. Something like this probably would pair well with obviously pasta, but I think more on the meat side, either a pork dish or maybe even a duck, actually, possibly, with yeah, something like this. I, would. I didn't check the, the color. If, obviously, you probably can't see this on camera, but I think the one that we just tasted is a little bit on the darker side. Yes, but uh, you know, when you start looking at color, this is when you get into the snob area of wine tasting. Uh, That's true, but I still like a little <laughs> bit of snobbery with my wine tasting. But it's what determines the color? Is it uh, the varietal of grape? Is it how long it's been fermenting? Uh, it's, it is, the, uh, you know, there are some varietals that will have a darker color um, and the quality of the grape. Uh, but again, it's, it's, for me, it's really just about taste. If it tastes good to you, drink it. And that is, that'll be the key to this show for hopefully many more episodes is we want you to try different wines. Don't be afraid. Don't feel hesitant because it's either something you've never tried before. Go to tastings, try different wines. Let your palate explore the different varietals. Mm -hmm. And you determine what you like. But don't be sold on price. And I'll keep hammering that point yep. in over and over <laughs> on this show. Don't let price fool you because the wines we're tasting here tonight are all under $15. And I think these would pair well with any of the blind tastings yeah. we've done in the past, I think would fool some of our snobbery friends. Exactly. I, I would not be afraid to serve this to my discriminating wine friends. And that actually leads me into another topic that I want to go into, and we'll be discussing this in other episodes, is when you are going to do, say, a blind tasting with friends, family, and so forth, is it important what you're going to pair that with for either an appetizer or a meal? Like, I know in the past when me and uh, James have done tastings, we usually have had either hors d'oeuvres or one of your favorite things to do. Uh, my crostini five ways. Um, it's, a, it's a crostini that has five different toppings. Each topping is designed to bring out a different element of the wine. Uh, the crostini interacts with a different part of the tongue, and when that happens, you get a different flavor from the wine. But this is, you're jumping ahead probably to a future episode we're going to do. That's true. I just wanted to give you a taste of where we're going because... Even though we have a lot of different wines we want to share with you, we want you to understand that when you're watching this show, to think about what you want to do with wine yourself, where you want to take it. Do you just want to have a glass with friends, or do you want to do something where it's going to broaden your horizons or broaden your palate, and like you said earlier, try different varietals of wine, especially if you haven't before. 
that's my favorite part about wine, is, is going out uh, every weekend, going to a new location, trying five or six new wines that I've never had before. You never know when you're going to find that next diamond in the rough. And I've uh, been doing this for a number of years and found a lot of niche wines that don't get marketed very heavily, uh, but they have phenomenal flavors or some other characteristic about them that makes, them, makes me want to share them with my friends. And it's, it's just an ongoing adventure. And I, I do want to recommend doing the Connecticut Wine Trail. I know there are pros and cons of it. I mean, I happen to like some Connecticut wines. I know, James, you... Uh... I, I've done the wine trail. I really recommend it for people who are looking for a great uh, Saturday afternoon, Sunday afternoon event. Uh, you can always pack a picnic lunch when you go to some of these vineyards. Um, buy a bottle of their wine, have your picnic lunch there. Uh, it makes a great date. It's a great way to get out and see a lot of different areas of the Connecticut state and, uh, and the, but I, I have to say they're not the best wines in the world. No, I, I don't want to talk, I don't want to down talk. That's them, okay. That's, this is an open show. I mean, is it because they don't use 100% Connecticut grown? Uh, no, it's, this is just not a great area for wine growing. Um, there, there are a couple of really good local grown wines, but for the most part, uh, you're going to, if you're a discriminating wine taster, you're going to be a little disappointed. Is that both for the reds and the whites? Especially for the reds, there are some good whites, um, and there's there are there are several local vineyards that actually import grapes from California, and they make some pretty good wines. But I don't count those as Connecticut wines. Now, what about some of the upstate New York wine, uh, vineyards and so forth? Now, they somewhat have a good reputation too. But are, are they under the same category as here in New England that they still have to import some of their grapes? Well, no. In the in the Finger Lakes area of New York, uh, you find them growing mostly Riesling, uh, which is a sweeter wine. Uh, that, that thrives very well in that environment. And uh, I did a tour of, of one of the lakes. There are actually five or six lakes up there, but uh, I, I, you know, there's too many vineyards and not enough time. And, uh, but I, I tasted quite a few really good Rieslings. That's actually when I fell in love with Rieslings. I, I had not uh, enjoyed sweet wines up until that point. Uh, but I found so many, and, and there were enough uh, the variations between them that I could, I could start to discriminate between them and, and pick out a few that I really enjoyed. Well, it's interesting you should mention a story like that, which sort of opened, up, opened you up a little bit to different types of wine. Um, there was a movie out recently, I think it was called Bottle Shock. Yeah. And I was never a big Chardonnay guy. I mean, I still like my whites on the drier side, but I do like a Riesling. But after seeing that movie, which I, I think you're sort of a big fan of yourself and you could talk Loved about. It. Loved it. Um, I actually like Chardonnays now. It sort of made me, my bias towards a buttery Chardonnay, which I didn't like. Turns out there are plenty of other Chardonnays that don't have that buttery characteristic. And what about that movie do you recall that uh, was so well, interesting? The, the, the whole point of that movie was that French wines up until the early 70s had been the only kind of wine that people really talked about. Uh, it was French wine and then a bunch of junk. So uh, and the American market really wasn't involved? It, in... The American market wasn't mature and supposedly were not creating great wines. But unbeknownst to the French, there were some really good vineyards in California producing some really great Chardonnays. And a blind tasting was arranged between the French wines and the California wines. And wouldn't you know it, the California wines ended up winning that competition. Uh, and these were French tasters, by the way. So they, they had no idea that they were picking the foreign wine and, and uh, let down their own countrymen. I will say that that movie was uh, an opening for me in regards to my... Uh, bias towards Chardonnay because mm. after seeing it, I wanted to go out and taste American Chardonnays. Right. And I tried to taste as many as I could, probably more than I should have. <laughs> and it turns out that I actually like Chardonnays more than I thought because most of my experience with Chardonnays were probably on the French side. Um, well, you know, the, the, the usual Chardonnay that you get uh, from California is going to have a lot of uh, butter or a lot of oak flavor to it. Which uh, even though I complained about, it turns out I still liked. But it's, it's a very, yeah, it's a very noticeable difference from a, a French wine. And when the, when the American tasters are having a Cal, California cabs or a California Chardonnay, they get a lot more flavor uh, with, with uh, French wines. They get what's called terroir, which is more of an earthy taste. It sort of has that minerally yes. quality to it. Yes. Yeah. And to, to a French palate, uh, they can discriminate between the different types of terroir. They, you know, they can taste a more of a chalky taste to it or a, a more of a, a dirt kind of. It's, it's we're going to do a whole show on French wines at some point we will in the future. Do so a we'll whole get show. into this. But 
Uh, I'm still partial to French wines, by the way. <laughs> so in your experience also in regards to when you go out to buy a wine mm -hmm. and you do a tasting, say if you're not doing a tasting, when you go into a liquor store or wine store, what is it you generally look for in regards, say you're looking for a red, do you have a, a certain preference that you're drawn to? Um, you I, like, say, cabs, uh, Merlots, I mean. Well, I love all the varietals. You do, but, but right, I, now, I, right now in, in James' life, what rocks your boat? I look for a lot of fruit or a lot of uh, vanilla taste. There, there are a lot of great uh, Pinot Noirs out there that have kind of a vanilla flavor to them. Uh, sometimes a creamy quality, so it's almost like a, a milky texture in your mouth. And what uh, about red Zinfandels? I know those are making sort of a pretty big comeback right now. I, I got into red Zinfandels about 10 years ago, and then they, they sort of got overshadowed by Syrah and Shiraz. Um, but there, yeah, there's some great Zinfandels out there. There are. And I think that's one of the things that I was fascinated with, because up until recently, I didn't even thought of trying a red Zinfandel. And there were actually, turns out that I disappointed myself for not trying it earlier because I was missing out. Yeah. And well, a lot of people confuse the red Zinfandel with the white, white Zinfandel. White Zinfandel, which uh, the white Zinfandel has a very bad reputation. It's justified. Seems, uh, yes, but it's it's uh, if you were to rank wines on a spectrum, that would be at the low end of the spectrum. Um, and it, but the red Zinfandel is completely different taste. Uh, it has a lot of body, a lot of fruit. Uh, they're they're bold wines. Um, they, it's almost like they smack you in the face. Now, is a red Zinfandel still mostly an American red? Uh, you'll can, find those in other regions, but the, 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 a lot of the really good ones are coming out of California. That's what I thought. I mean, there's a lot of great vineyards out in uh, Sonoma and so forth yeah. that uh, produce some great red wines. And say, for instance, with the holiday coming up, Thanksgiving, is there any particular type of white wine that uh, sort of you're into right now? Like, what do you like? I'm a Sauvignon Blanc guy. I, that's what I drink primarily also, yeah. Sauvignon Blanc. And is there any good um, uh, regions that are good for you right now, like Argentinian? Or... Uh, there's some South African Sauvignon Blancs. Um, I serve a, a particular Argentinian Sauvignon Blanc uh, all the time. It's, uh, it's a $7 bottle, and my friends love I it. I think I've had that one. Yes. I've... And trust me, it does not taste like a $7 bottle <laughs> at all. And I think that's what everybody was surprised at, because we did not know how much it cost until the end of the evening when... Well, that just, yeah, that just goes back to our earlier point. Try a lot of wines, uh, especially in the lower part of the price spectrum. You'll find some great ones, and there are a lot of good deals out there, uh, especially from some of these up-and-coming wine-producing regions. Uh, they, they can't price their wines at the high end and compete with California and France, uh, so you're, you're finding some really good deals from, from places like Australia, uh, Argentina, Chile, South Africa. Actually, it's funny because Australian wines used to be the rage for quite a while, mm -hmm. and they sort of been surpassed a little by some of the Spanish wines that are out now and some of the other regions. But Australian it, wines are still they, they, they still make some great wines. Pretty good, and you know you could, you could have tried a wine ten years ago, and it's still going to taste great today. But there are other regions that, that have become more popular. Well, um, in conclusion, I think we're just about ready to wrap up with our first show. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, it was our first show, so give us a chance to give you another one, and. I'm Bobby P. And I'm James Kimbrough. And until next time, keep, keep us, us in your, your wine, wine cellar. cellar.